What's up? We're back. We're with uh, Coach Mike and the one and only Daquan Plowden, man. I, I appreciate you so much for hopping on. He is uh, the guard, kind of forward, kind of in-between guy, uh, starter for the Birmingham Squadron, uh, which is the Pelicans G League team. Man, the really the only the question I really want to ask you as a slow white dude with a broke jump shot, how is it being in the G League, man? How How is that experience for you? <laughs> um it's a it's a nice it's a nice experience you know um i'm starting to develop a little bit more at the professional level and um this is a great way to you know kick start that development so you've lived in uh, you grew up in uh, pennsylvania you moved to ohio for college at bowling green then you flew down to be a part of the pelicans training camp and now you're sitting in birmingham man so what what is it like moving so much and having to get acclimated with all these different coaches and all these different cities and lifestyles and all these other different things, man? What what has that transition been like? That is that is that tough? Is it hard? Are you tired of living living your life out of a a, a kind of a a, a roll go bag and stuff like that? Um, I mean, learning how to live out of like a suitcase and everything early kind of helps. Uh, all the traveling uh, makes it a little easier. But honestly, the adjustment hasn't been a hard adjustment. You know, I feel like my hardest adjustment was moving from Philly to Ohio, you know, to, mm. you know, play college basketball. And just how I adjusted there really taught me a lot of skills that I take along with me now being in New Orleans for a while and now being down here with Birmingham. That's awesome. So I know that, like I said, playing with Birmingham, playing with uh, the Pelicans, you've been around a lot of coaches, right? You've been around a lot of different people. Um, some of the people that the, Pel the Pelicans fan base really love are coaches like, you know, Teaspoon and coaches like Willie Green, the people that, that really pour into you and stuff like that. Obviously, doing really well in summer league and showing out um, there ha has really helped your stock and been able to do those things really well. So when you think about the coaches that you've encountered so far, right, the coaches that you've been able to, whether that's college or high school or maybe even AAU ball, um, something like that. Well, who has been the, or who have been the coaches that have stood out to you the most? Like the, these people have really, really helped me, whether it's just their attitude, whether it's their basketball knowledge about that, uh, about things that maybe you need help with in your game, who has stood out the most to you? Um, I don't think I can really pinpoint one coach. Like I feel like okay. all my coaches at each level have helped me progress in some way, shape, and form, whether that be through um, a critical feedback on how I'm playing or, you know, just uh, doing film or just, you know, staying in my ear, you know, off the court, on the court. Like, I feel like all of my coaches have provided me with some type of information that has helped me on this journey. So, I mean, I can't really pinpoint one coach that was just like a standout coach to me. But, you know, I, I appreciate all the coaches that I have encountered and that have uh, help me along this process. Mm. What do you think is the the difference from level to level? Right, you've went, um, you did a, a lot of really really awesome things uh, when you uh, were at Mastery Charter. You did a lot of things when you know you were at Bowling Green and with now with the Birmingham Squadron um, and with the Pelicans. Obviously, what has been what has been the biggest difference that you've noticed going from one division to the other, from one team, kind of elevating your play at each. Um, at each juncture, what do you think has been the biggest jump that maybe you didn't expect or you had to really uh, adjust your mindset to? Been uh, attention to detail. I feel like the the level mm -hmm. of focus that you need at each level. I'm not gonna say it's different, but you know, now being at a professional level, it has to be that much more sharper, has to be that much more keen, and um, because there's less room for mistakes. So I feel like mm -hmm. just the the level of focus and the amount of intensity that is brought every day. Like when I say like, you know, I, I had my first eye open experience in the Pelicans where, you know, those guys were going at each other's throat. And it's like, you know, afterwards, mm -hmm. hey, you trying to go, you know, grab some food or like, like it was like super intense. But at the same time, like those guys are like, that's a culture, like that's, that's a good culture to have. Mm -hmm. Mm. So take me through a day, man. What what does a day look like for you? Whether it's a, a game day or an off day, what does let, let's say an, an off day when you're getting ready for like you know you guys have a, a game tomorrow uh, night at seven o'clock. Let's say that today, what does your day look like today in the G League? What time do you wake up? What does film study or practices or workouts or whatever it is? What does that really look like uh, in a day to day thing for you? Okay, so yeah, I, I like to wake up an hour before I have to like really get out and go anywhere. 
Uh, that way I get myself, uh, you know, ready for the day, make myself breakfast, uh, feel my body out, you know, whatever, you know, nooks and grains I feel like, you know, are sore, whatever the case may be, try to, you know, work through that a little bit early. Um, head to the gym, maybe roughly around like nine, um, you know, get ready for practice, do my treatments, my correctives, my weights, all that stuff. I uh, go through practice. By the time I come home, it's already right around like three o'clock. Uh, I come home, you know, decompress a little bit. Um, then I start doing my film. Like as we uh, play tomorrow, I start breaking down my my scouts and um, just start trying to mentally prepare for what's to come tomorrow. I feel like that's the biggest thing mm. um, throughout my day, especially coming coming up on the game day. Like the mental preparation can't be the day of. Like it has to be before that time comes. So. I definitely like to start getting myself mentally prepared, but like also try, like trying to stay a little relaxed as well. So I like to play my game. I stream mm-hmm. on Twitch a little bit. Um, so even though that I'm going through my scouts, you know, I'm still like mellow. I'm still like, you know, really relaxed. And then, you know, I turn my intensity up tomorrow. Mm. That's awesome. The last thing I have before I turn it over to to Coach Mike, you know, we divided it up. I was texting him the other day. I was like, I was like, hey man, you want to get defense? I'll get offense. We'll kind of divide it up that way. Uh, I let him have defense because I know that you're a, a defensive guy, man, and defense is something that a lot of teams need, man. A lot of teams need some defense this year. I'll be honest with you. So I won't be surprised if you get a call. But um, when you think about um, the the game kind of as a whole, when you think about uh, being in Birmingham, is it tough is it kind of weird um, or tell me what it's like for you for, for instance uh kyra lewis just got assigned to birmingham today and uh, uh seabrun just got assigned to birmingham the other day and it has, has started playing some games tell me what tell me what that's like to have you know your core roster of you know 13 to 15 guys and then also you know you have guys that will come down that will be designated for assignment to go back to the team tell me tell me what that looks like uh, is it weird is it kind of an adjustment period i know sometimes for me playing on AU ball, you would have a coach bring in somebody that is like, we just got this kid off the yeah. street like two days ago. <laughs> Good luck throwing it in type of thing. So tell me, tell me what that's a little bit like, man. Um, honestly, it's great. Like, you know, we have a lot of good people in our organization. So when we, get, when we do get guys that come down from the Pelicans, um, you know, it's still a great culture. Like the things that they preach up there are the same things we teach down here. Um, so everything is spot on. Like, you know, the, the expectation is high. Um, those guys come down, they hold us accountable. You know, even with us, with them, with teaching them what we do, maybe if things are a little bit different, like, you know, just trying to keep that accountability uh, within everybody. But, you know, the culture is great. Like the people that come down are great. Like, you know, so, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it, it, it's not a weird thing. Like, it's just, mm. you know, it's just like, hey, what's up? Like, the guy yeah. coming down, it's like a real chill vibe. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, hey, Coach Mike, he has this YouTube channel called Film Don't Lie where he, like, goes into insane detail mm-hmm. on stuff. So you might get some pretty tough questions. I'm That's not going right. to lie to That's you. Right. But, <laughs> Coach Mike, go ahead. What's up, Dave? How you doing? Pretty good, man. Good to meet you. Uh, Drew, your agent, man, I've been knowing him for a couple of years. Good people. He was high on you in the spring. He was he was through the roof on you, Andre. It was good to get to know you a little bit before you got uh, before you got drafted or selected by the Um I had a couple of questions in regards to your transition. The first question, rather, is regards to your transition from college to to the pro level. And you know, you spend four years, like first, you spend four years being able to sit in the paint and help defense. You know, see bossing man. Make sure you're below the level of the ball. You don't have to get out if you're going to non shoot. You can basically just sit and paint the whole half. And then all of a sudden, you've got to retrain your brain from basically end of April, whenever your college season ends, into whenever you have like a mini camp, maybe May, June, going to some league. How fast, how hard was that transition when you have to go from being able to sit in the paint and help defense for four years, uh, rotate a certain way? some of the terminology and all of a sudden just like that you gotta you gotta change it up to where if you sit in the paint more than two point nine seconds you get in the tech and you cost you team points. How how was that transition? Um the transition for me was uh 
it, it took some time. It took some time for me, you know, playing at a, a, a school where we were heavy help out of the paint, you know. Um, it took a lot of training to get out of those habits of, you know, a college system to now a pro organization. Um, but, you know, every day, you know, I, I go through film with my coaches um, and just try to find ways to, like, really try to, like, change those habits up, you know, just doing as much time as I can on the film or, uh, going over it with, you know, I talked, I, I talked a lot with Herb Jones, just, you know, trying to be on defensive coverages. Um, Jeez, it's a good one to ask. So <laughs> it, 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 took, it took me a good amount of time, but I'm glad that I spent training camp with the Pels and, um, you know, being down here, like we, we go over our, in our shell every day, our rotations and everything. So uh, still getting out of those habits, but, you know, mm. building on to the habits that I'm now like, you know, setting in stone. Right, right. That's, that makes sense, isn't it? And Herb is a real good person to learn from. Uh, having Jose and Herb, it's got to be, gotta be great because you get the point guard aspect and you get the off-ball aspect of, you know, defense at that level, right? Definitely. To, to piggyback that first question, would be everybody talks about the speed of the game changing uh, from college to pro. Uh, but – how much of that also you talk about as much you talk about your film study and you know sitting with coaches and like you talk like you mentioned sitting with her does does having the IQ aspect of the lockdown help with the speed of the game? Like if you know it'll be ahead of time, you won't have to you know speed in that lettuce it won't matter as much, or does it does it matter regardless? I feel like the speed of the game will be fast regardless, but you know, having a higher IQ and, um, you know, taking that time to really lock down on film and just talking to the guys about what they see and how they read things, and how they react. I feel like, like all of that stuff does play a huge role in, you know, for instance, my development. Um, at Summer League, I felt like the game had slowed down just from, you know, communicating with those guys and everything. And, you know, that's a good feeling to have because now I don't feel like I'm rushing. I don't feel like I'm playing out of pace. Like, so I feel like all of those things do tie in, uh, very closely to, you know, the flow of the game. Cool, man. That's, oh, when I was watching, watching you fly around on defense with the BHAM squad, um, one thing I noticed, well, one, not one thing I noticed, but one thing I wanted to ask, um, what you being, which coming from a heavy help side school, and then not just, not just at Bowling Green, but college in general, because it's so, because the lane's so clogged, because there's no paint restrictions on defense, you always, if you're an offensive player, those driving gaps are way, way less. And then all of a sudden, I'm watching you, you know, go from the nail and having to fly out to somebody who's playing, you know, four feet off the three point line. Now, so you have to close a lot further than what you normally, what, you, what you've been used to the last four years. Is it, I would assume that. It's way harder to guard. Obviously, you don't know who to close out to, whether it be a short closeout or a long closeout. So, Scott would want to take that. But still, does the amount of spacing that you have to play with now, does that make it even harder, considering how much time you will put in film? Or, again, does it go back to the IQ question where right, I've, I've done my scout reports, I've watched film, I know who I'm closing out to. Um, does the spacing, the spacing difference how, how much harder does it make for you as an individual defender to be successful, especially when you be at the point of attack? Yeah, I feel like, you know, going over a lot of that information in film helps a lot because then now we know who to, like, you know, stunt real hard at and then get out to, like, in terms of, like, shooters, um, not really not really leaving guys. Um, but, you know, IQ does play a huge role in it because, you know, being heavy nail help and understanding, like, okay, I know that this guy, he really want to drive nail hard and kick out to the shooter that's right here. Like, I've seen him doing it, watching game after game after game, like, rep after rep. Um, so then, like, you start making mental notes, like, all right, I know he's going to drive nail hard, make sure I get pulled in, and then try to kick for an easy three. So then, like, you know, I, everything is, like, you know, so to so closely correlated that it's just, you know, the, you having that a higher IQ is like, you know, make make you like that much better on defense when it comes to reads like that. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like the work. Defense is hard enough as it is. Having been somebody who was dependent on to get stops and I was, that was my main role in college. Man, defense is hard. You know, getting through screens is hard. 
chasing chasing shoes off the line is hard. Chasing shoes at wrong speeds is hard. Being able to guard multiple positions and, and that's on top of health and recovery, mm-hmm. taking charge, love, stuff like that, like you're talking about. So, um, just like you said, having having a good understanding of what your matchup will do, along with what certain other guys on the roster that you may match up will do or help. So it's almost like working smarter, not harder, making sure that you have the IQ, the the knowledge of your opponent before you get on the court. Because now you can pick and choose when you want to be an athlete and now you're not burning yourself out before the game's over. Mm -hmm. Especially down the street where you need to get a key stop or need to get a key body stop or be in the right spot to take a charge. Most definitely. Tell me this, Dave. What... What were some things that, just defensively now, what are some things that teams saw, specifically the Pels, maybe not the Pels, other team that you spoke to as well, but what, what are some of the things that teams saw in you that made them say, yo, man, we need to take a hard look at this dude because we see something from him down the line. And then conversely, what were some teams, what were some of those things, those te- what are some things those teams said that you may need to get better at defensively? Uh, if you want to kind of get a roster, get a roster spot, because you know you know better than us. It's not a, it's not making it is not is the hard part. I mean, making it is not just the hard part. Staying Man, it's in the it hardest part. Is the hard part. Yeah, um, you know, I think some things that really made me stand out was just uh, my will to want to go, like want to go to go guard. Um, I guess how good of a shot blocker I was coming out of college. Um, just how much pride and how much of a chip I carried on my shoulders being a defender. I feel like um, mm-hmm. those things made me stand out and just how physical I am, you know, as a defender, you know. Um, it definitely highlighted me as one of the guys that is willing to go do the dirty work. And I feel like, like you said yes. in the beginning, like everybody's mm-hmm. looking for guys that can defend. Um, everybody's looking for guys that are those blue guys that are going to do the you know, the things that everybody else don't want to do or, you know, somebody getting paid however many millions of dollars to go score the ball. All right, now we need somebody to get a stop. So yeah. I think that's really something that really made me stand out a little bit. And just the energy I carried on the court was so, like, contagious. And I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, if one person has enough energy to do that, just imagine how many how many more people they can pull in that had that same type of connectivity with that type of energy. So now you got – you just rolling, you rolling, rolling with momentum. So I feel like, you know, teams saw me as a player that can uh, be one of those pieces that can, you know, really lock somebody up and um, carry energy without having the ball in my hands or without having to score the ball. Because, you know, nowadays everybody wants to score the ball. Yeah. Um, I think something that um, that kind of also, like, you know, made teams shy away from me a little bit was, you know, coming out of college, I felt like I was a good defender. And, you know, being at a pro level, there's great scorers out there, like people who can just literally just flat out score the ball. So I think the main thing for me was, you know, having the title of only being a good defender and not a great defender. I feel like that's something that that really separates, um, you know, guys that get called up and, you know, are thought out to be the Herb Jones of the league or, you know, the Jose Alvarado's and stuff like that. So I feel like, you know, that's probably like my biggest thing now, going from being just good defender to a great defender that's capable of locking up anybody. Right. Mm-hmm. I see it on film, man. I, when I watch, watch when I watch over the weekend, I see act, yeah, yeah, activity on the ball. Uh, it was one drive. I think you guys were playing the Texas Legends. And I was actually surprised they didn't call a foul, but uh, the guy drove middle and that, that right forearm hit him and they went backwards. I mean, you didn't lunge into him. You just kind of just stuck him. And you just moved your feet and they went backwards. And that's that's good to see because you're going to need that. You, you know, pressure at the point of attack is, is key, especially with the way people are just opening the court up and just getting downhill, getting downhill. So if you can, if you can guard the ball, with some consistency, then like you said, you'll find the court because I, I like it in the football. Everybody wants to have the best quarterback, but if you can't get the best quarterback, then you better get somebody who can either sack him all the time or stop him from throwing a bunch of touchdowns. Mm-hmm. So you gotta have some dudes on the other side that can stop him from yeah, scoring. So definitely. you're in the right you're in the right culture uh, as far as defensive intensity, energy, 
uh, I like your hand activity. I like your wingspan. Some of those closing out, and I'm like, this dude hasn't touched the ceiling. You know, you just getting deflection just just because you're just flying around. That stuff, that stuff matters at any level, but especially in the league, you're trying to create easy points and get out and run. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I think you got I think you got a shot. Um, one of I mean, to to kind of get into it, I, um, Jake mentioned earlier about guys at the next level coming down, but before. Before you, before the BM squad started, how much did having to defend BI, CJ, you know, maybe matching, I mean, switching and having to guard Zion a couple of possessions in training camp and in the preseason, how much confidence did that give you that you can guard? Maybe not lock down any, everybody because it's going to be some off nights. We all have them. But guarding those guys in preseason training camp, what did that do for you confidence wise going into? This season with the BM squad. Um, I mean, it it definitely you know gave me a confidence booster knowing that I'm I'm going in guarding these guys and getting this experience early. Um, but it definitely changed my perspective on how to how to guard and you know, mm. um, guarding some of these guys like they're gonna make some crazy shots. They're gonna make some crazy mm-hmm. shots. I learned that early guarding BI. Like you're gonna make some crazy shots. Um, but like just sticking with it and trying to be consistent, like, um, you know, BI stayed in my ear, like, Hey, listen, like, you know, you, you right there in a defensive shift or like, if even being on ball, like just keep doing what you're doing. Like keep being a pest, like guys is going to make shots. You're not going to take that away from them. Like guys is going to make shots regardless. So, I mean, just continuing to do what I do and knowing that I'm still a good defender at the end of the day, like, you know. That's definitely something that like boosted my confidence coming down to Birmingham, and you know, honestly, just getting that preseason experience. Like Victor Oladipo ain't no, you know, easy guy to guard. Yeah, like, I, I would say like he's yeah. not no easy guy to guard. But like being able to play <laughs> against these guys that early, you know, as a rookie, and like, oh shoot, like I'm I'm standing in front of Victor Oladipo, like. Or like you know, just being in shifts or getting blocks, or like just just those little things are like crazy confidence boosters. Because it's like now you're getting to see like, oh shoot, now I can like really defend at this level. So oh, then like hmm. yeah, so it was a it was a big confidence boost. Like you know, talking to those guys and being able to guard and defend, and you know, just gaining some uh, pointers on how to be a, the best defender I can be. That's pretty cool, man. That's cool that you got that experience. Um, my last one. Um, What's, what's one thing you tell a kid, you know, you come from a mid-major, kind of not under the radar, and what I do is, with Film No Lie, I, you know, I try to give some shine to some of the guys that, that fly under the radar. Um, what would you tell a kid that was that's in your shoes? Maybe you're on the edge, you know, some people may or may not want to go the distance or go full. What would you tell a kid that's walking in your shoes right now that maybe has a chance but just needs a couple words to just kind of keep help keep perspective, keep driving forward. Remember why you started. I feel like mm-hmm. for me, like it always came down to why I started to play basketball, like why I um, decided to take basketball this far, why I decided to go in and grind the days that I felt sluggish or felt like, you know, I didn't really want to get up and do it. Like why days that I felt like, you know what, I don't want to do this no more. Like going back and remembering, like, listen, I started this for a reason. I started this because I, I got a plan. I started this because it's, like, for me, for me specifically, I feel like me playing basketball is, or just me on this journey is much bigger than me. So I remind myself, there, like, listen, I can't take this for granted. I got to, while I'm here, while I'm doing it, like, while I'm still ambitious about it, remember why I started this in the first place. And I feel like that's going to really carry people over the hump that a lot of college athletes get hit with. Just, and mm-hmm. it's going to make you hungry again because you're like, you know what? I, I was hungry when I started this because I wanted to be the best person I can be at this level, at the high school level, college level, like whatever the case may be. So just really understanding, like, listen, I started this for a reason. I'm going to keep trying for this same reason. Like, um, just I, I really feel like it just boils down to just understanding your why, like understanding it and referring yourself back to it. That's dope. Mm. I'm going to take that advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's awesome. Well, one of the things I really wanted to touch on the offensive side of the ball, like you talked about a little bit earlier, you're a very, very, and you can tell it on tape. You can tell. I mean, even in games, uh, sometimes those the the mics on the court will pick up, especially when you played big games. Um, you know, at, at Bowling Green, you would pick up. Uh, you could hear you yelling defensive assignments or cuts or, like you said, uh, nails, pins, whatever it is, to your teammates. I, I saw a lot that your defense really sparked your offense, right? And I think that part of it is because you really took pride in your defense, and I think that that's natural, you know. Um, and you talked a little bit more on defense uh, about how, you know, you look at guys like Herb Jones and Jose, like Herb went in the second round, you know, the 40-something pick because people had questions about his offensive side of the ball. But, you know, everybody knew how well he could defend. And you talk about Jose, I mean, he went completely undrafted. Part of that is because they had questions about the offensive side of the ball as well as, you know, his height, which is unfortunate, but it's a product of the system in the NBA. So the question I have for you, and you can see it so far this year, is how has that adjustment been? Because a lot of your game is absolutely going at the rim and taking people's heads off, right, getting the rebounds and getting the put-bad dunks, but also the three-point line. And every year in college, your three-point percentage got better. You took more. You gained more confidence um, with that. So how has that been in the NBA adjusting, not only taking that couple of feet back, but also maybe changing a little bit of your shot to get a little bit more power, whether it's bending deeper or having a more crisp follow through. What, what has that transition been like? Um, it's been an interesting uh, process, honestly. Like uh, it started with like, you know, I let my defense fuel me, um, you know, coming into college, wasn't the best offensive player, but, you know, taking the time to observe, like, I I played with a lot of scores, so observing how they got to the rim, observing how they use their body, observing how they got their balance when they shot, and then when I go work out, I go work on my balance. I go work on you know thinking about how I'm using my body to protect the ball and get to the rim, and just how they manipulate the defense to get what they want. Um, I feel like I'm a, a really good observer in that type of, or a really good visual observer. Um, when it comes to that stuff. And I feel like, you know, just taking the time to sit and watch how Herb is transforming his, his offensive game to now be like, oh, shoot, he's a two-way player right now. Like, he's killing on both ends. Like, um, just taking the time to really do my research and do my due, due diligence and, like, you know, just understanding, like, hey, it's, it's going to be a process, like, getting better at scoring at this level. There's some great defenders out there that, you know, go and lock you up and just understand, like, hey, that don't make me a bad offensive player. It just means, like, you know, you got to be patient. You got to understand your reads, and you just got to know the best mismatches to score. So I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, being in Birmingham now is starting to train my mind, like, okay, how, how, how can I score or how can I get – a bucket for my teammate or how can I create a mismatch to where we had an advantage going downhill or driving kicks or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, it's, it's a very interesting process because there's always a new way to like find a rim or find a, um, a mismatch in a screen and roll type of uh, action. So it's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, I, I, I can I can see that, especially when I was watching offensive tape because I, I went and watched uh, when you first came in and, you know, so a little bit of the COVID year and some of this most recent year. Your your ball handling has gotten a lot better um, from when you first came in to, to where you're at now. And part of that's confidence. Part of that, that is reps. But uh, I think that is a very, very important part and and under yeah i mean even guys like kyle anderson you know slow-mo he is not the fastest guy on the court he is not he does not have the quickest can handles or anything like that but he knows how to play right and i think a big part of that education on the offensive side of the ball is just learning how to play and i think that you you, you really did end up in, in a fantastic position to grow right because i i watched uh, a lot of pre-draft interviews from you and Herb and Larry and even EJ Liddell a little bit, uh, one of your teammates this summer. And you, all three of you, all four of you kind of got wrapped in the same mold of like probably too big to play a consistent guard and probably too small to play a consistent forward. So you have that uh, in-between game a lot. But I think what that means for uh, a lot of uh, people that, that have that is that you get, you have to defend this wide variety, which also means 
that you have to go against offensively a wide variety. So how do you attack a guard versus how do you attack a forward or even a center if they're switched on to you? How, how do you, like, if you're looking at a guy like Victor Oladipo in front of you or if you're looking at a guy like, you know, Jonas or, uh, you know, Jackson Hayes or even Larry, you know, how, how do you address those and attack those different types of uh, players? Um, I feel like I benefited from playing, you know, one through five in college. Um, but mm. I feel like the main like part that really helped me was playing power forward and center. Like I feel like now I got it from a now I got a perspective on like if I'm playing against a smaller guard, like you know using my body a little bit more. Like I'm not gonna beat him with quickness. And um, you know when I when I get mismatches with power forwards and centers and everything like that, like all right now I'm just trying to maybe have a, have a go catch already going downhill to the rim. Like it's going to take those guys a little longer to recover to me. So um, just trying to understand like, okay, smaller guards, usually faster. You know, I could probably mm. put myself in a position where it's like, okay, now I got to use my body a little bit more, you know, give off a bump before I go to the rim. Well, guys is bigger than me. All right. Now I'm trying to use my quickness to get around them or get to where I would need to get to. Um, but I, I think that all just boils down to, like, you know, trying to – or slowly but surely, like, learn how to manipulate the, the different defensive defensive coverages. Mm. I think that's – one of the things I saw is that even in, in the summer league, um, I, I didn't get to, a lot of, get to watch uh, last night or the other night's game um, that y'all played in Texas. But one of the things that you have that a lot of guards don't have because you played so much center – um, and power forward at Bowling Green is you have a lot of bat to the basket moves. You have a lot of moves that are really, really awesome to see because, like you said, when you've got smaller guards, the Gabe Vincent, even Jose kind of a little bit type guards on you, you have a little bit more uh, versatility. And not only that, I think a very, very underrated part of your game is passing. I, I think that you really are a fantastic passer because you see the lanes. And I think one of the things that you got caught in a lot at Bowling Green is you see the floor and you have that high IQ just a little bit better than some other people and so when you're expecting a cut they pop when you know you're expecting a pin a pin down they may be a come and set a screen so you got into a lot of those little turnovers there that that are unfortunate but they happen so uh, but so when you are um, you know going at somebody who is smaller um, looking for your paint moves is, are you looking to score first or are you looking for the best shot available first uh, I found myself to be somebody to find the best shot available um, you know, growing up, I, I always watched Rajon Rondo and how he distributed the basketball when he was with that Boston Celtics team. And, um, you know, being, you know, that kind of like tweener type of forward guard, um, sometimes you got to understand like, hey, listen, I know I'm about to draw a lot of attention. So now, now it's time for me to find guys. Now it's time for me to find guys. Like at Bowling Green, like my last season probably was like the most when I've seen that. You know, I had a lot of good, mm. great guys come before me. And, um, you know, my last year really taught me how to be, like, the number one option and understand, like, okay, now I got to start thinking about how I'm getting my teammates involved because I know I'm about to bring in a lot of attention. Like, I feel like that last year really taught me a lot on the offensive end and, you know, how how we used to guard guys that were, like, high caliber, you know, the guys that are the man on their team, like, now guys are trying to, you know, find ways to, you know, stop me and everything like that. So I feel like, you know, um, I feel like I, you know, really look for the best shot possible first. Mm, that's awesome. The last question I have for you, we everybody talks, uh, one of the most popular things that they talk about now is the welcome to the NBA moment, right? Everybody has one and stuff like that. I, I don't want to talk about maybe the bad welcome to the NBA moment for you because with Zion and B.I. and some of the athletes and just ball players on the Pelicans, that could probably get pretty ugly. I want to talk about a time where you were in training camp, whether it's a block or a steal or a dunk or maybe a move that you hit on somebody. What was the time you know that you were like, you know what, I, I really do belong here? Um, I think it was just my consistency. Um, I started yeah. to see that, you know, I can guard at a high level, at the professional level. I can, you know, still learning, but, you know, find ways to score at the professional level and just, you know, 
how my teammates were feeding off my energy. I feel like all those things were pretty consistent throughout and the feedback that I was getting, you know, I started to morally, you know, feel better just knowing that like, you know, the coaching staff around me is letting me know like, hey, listen, like we we see it, but you just gotta keep showing it, like type of thing. And I'm mm-hmm. you know, I I felt good about that. You know, I talked to my parents a lot about it. Um but at the end of the day, you know, my parents are going to be the most straightforward people. Like, All right, yeah, they tell you that, but listen, just go out there, keep proving it, <laughs> keep keep being consistent like you have been. So I feel like that was my good welcome to the NBA moment. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, hey, Coach Mike, thanks so much for hopping on, Daquan. It was a really an awesome, uh, awesome to see you. I hope that you stay healthy this year, and uh, more than anything, I hope you get uh, on a roster because you definitely deserve it. You have all the tools uh, and more. Good luck this uh, this season, and you know, go kill them. Go, you know, make sure that uh, everybody knows Daquan Plowden by the end of the Thank year. You. Man. I appreciate that. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it.